God in prayer. Lord, from you comes life. From you comes all of the joys of living. And we look to you tonight to thank you for everything that you give. And as we think about life tonight, we ask that your grace might help us see things as you see them, and that we might rejoice in those wondrous and powerful truths that you've given to us in your word. Lord, I thank you for every person who has come here tonight. And I know that you have a reason for each one of us being here. And as we discover that reason, we want to say yes to you and know you as our loving Heavenly Father, for Christ's sake. Amen. How do you close the book on a life? We all have our private and precious memories. Let me share some of mine with you. Mom had a zest for life, and we all knew it. She enjoyed it to the full. This past spring, we had a beautiful weekend together as we traveled up to see one of her grandsons graduate from college. During that weekend, we were taken into a physics lab while my son John showed a project that he was working on. All of us got fatigued with the descriptions and the vocabulary and uh, got a cramp in our minds. And uh, But I was watching my mother, and she hung in there. And she was interested in asking questions. She had a zest for life. How do you close the book on someone close to you that had a zest for life and sort of permeated everything uh, that you did? Mom was a perfectionist and an idealist. And I can remember as a teenager having a running debate with her because I was a realist. You know, it's hard for a teenager to understand why he should go out and sweep the street and why there should be no streaks in the window after he's washed it and why there should be no bubbles in the paint if you were given a job to paint. Mom was a perfectionist, an idealist. Now I'm glad that she was. She always felt that she won that argument, and I think she took great delight in it and smiled many times because she knew she had won, because she'd remind me that I married a perfectionist and an idealist. Chalk that one up for Mom. Mom was an artist. She had a keen sense of beauty and form. 
This was betrayed in everything that she did, from making food to serving it on the table to, uh, well, just everything. I'm glad she was an artist. Had a sense of creativity. Liked to make things beautiful. Mom was a believer. Her loved ones had to have the best, and that meant participating in all the riches that were in Christ Jesus. She was a believer. She knew what Jesus' words were and the import of them when he said, What is a man profited? What does it profit a man? To gain the whole world and lose his own soul. And so this crept into her conversations and her prayers. And as we listen to the scripture tonight, we saw some of the product of those conversations and prayers. As a believing woman, it also meant the dedication of a yet unborn son to God's service. And God honored her prayers, and God was very conspicuous in her life. I was sharing with Dad last night before we all turned in, and he told me about his last night with Mom. We knew the end was coming. We knew it wouldn't be long. And he was with her, watching over her. And he dozed off. And he said as he slept, an old hymn that he had never thought of recently came to his mind, and he dreamt it. And the hymn went like this. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. Ye who are weary, come home earnestly and tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling. Oh, and then the one word was changed. Christian, come home. He woke from that went over to her bed and she had just slipped into the presence of Jesus. Amazing how God gives his, his children experiences like this. She was a believing woman and it wasn't one-sided. God heard and answered her prayers. I thank God for her as you do. She carried the flag that's the kind of woman she was. She carried the flag for her family. You know, it's something that you learn as you grow older. You know how it is with moms. I'll share this with you. Maybe you can use it in your own life. A couple of years ago, I stood down there as... We had a 50th wedding anniversary. Am I glad we did that? Am I glad we had that? But you know, you take moms for granted. You know, they're always there. They're always loyal. They always do what is expected. And we sort of take it for granted. You know, do you ever look at your mom as a real feeling person? Sometimes kids don't do that. in preparation for that 50th anniversary that we all enjoyed so much. We had put together a little folder, and I sat down with her and I said, this is what we're going to do, and this is how it's going to work. And she looked at that folder, and she broke down and cried. And it struck me that here's my mom, she has the emotions and everything that we sort of take for granted. 
Praise God for mothers. Don't take them for granted. But how do you close the book on a life like this? How do you fill the empty places now? How do you do that? What soothing balm is there for such earth-born weariness and grief? Is there any word? Is there any message that we could take to our hearts tonight? Is there some truth that would help us see beyond the sadness and the sorrow of this day? I believe there is. I believe there is. And I've put down some facts that I'd like to share with you tonight from the depths of my being. They minister to me and they'll minister to you. Fact number one. Our hope is in God's love and mercy. And while the book might be closed here, it has not been thrown on the rubbish pile. For God's word says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I cling to that truth. I hope that you cling to it. Life is very short. As I knew mom was sick, terminally ill, and I was thinking about it in my home, I had the feeling that I think you get when you're watching a sport event and your team is behind and the clock ticks away. And it keeps ticking and ticking. And I had this feeling that the clock was ticking out for mom. The time was going and that clock kept ticking away and ticking and ticking. And then when that dawned on me, I thought, well, the clock is ticking for you too. And the clock is ticking for each one of us. It's quick. Relentlessly, it moves on and on and on until the day that we come to the end of our earthly life. It moves on. We hope in God's love and mercy. You see, when the end of this life comes, what else are you going to hope in? And if you know that is the only thing to hope in in this kind of an experience, then hope in it now. Jesus was at an experience like this. It's recorded in John 11. Two sisters and a brother. The brother got sick. His name was Lazarus. They sent for Jesus. He was a friend of the family. He didn't get there in time. Lazarus died. The two sisters, Mary and Martha, were heartbroken and they came and said, Oh Lord, if you only would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus was at a funeral. I think he'd respond the same way today with us. I want to read to you what it says there in John 11. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then these two words, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, one of the most profound truths that you could find anywhere. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? I think simply he wept with the sorrow of those around him. And yet... We have to come back and say if he could understand that in a few moments he would say Lazarus come forth and Lazarus would come out of that grave and they'd have to untie him from all those grave clothes and let him go. Why should he weep? Why should he weep? And this is not the weeping, the polite weeping of a tear trickling down your cheek, but 
a rage and an anger and a sobbing. The kind of weeping that makes you embarrassed. Why? I think I know why. Because as he stood there with Mary and Martha and saw their sorrow, and I think all of the sorrow of the world and all of the countless funerals that have gone in their procession through the times of man's history, weighed in upon him as he realized again that it was not God's design. Death was not his design. A lot of people blame God for death. God, death was not God's design. Life was God's design. And death was man's choice. And I think he sobbed in grief over the idiocy of mankind that always chooses death instead of life. And he showed us that day that he had the power over the grave. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days, very significant four days. The Jews felt you might be able to revive a person in three, but not four. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen, a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. I love the Lord Jesus. There's no one like him. And there's no life like serving him. Our hope is in the love and mercy of God. The book is closed, yes. But there's more. Our certainty is in the fact that Jesus is alive. I like the way Peter says it in Second Peter chapter 1. You can just see that rough, tough fisherman standing up and saying these words after following the Lord Jesus with his idiosyncrasies and his weak points and his failings. Oh yes, but he knew something and he says this. We did not follow cunningly or cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Our certainty is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, the resurrection of Christ is not the kind of fact that you can bring into the laboratory to prove, but it is the kind of fact that you can bring into the courtroom and substantiate. The enemies of the gospel and those who don't believe attack the resurrection of Christ. In fact, those who don't believe realize that the Christian message stands on two pillars. One of them is the resurrection of Christ from the dead. If he rose from the dead, then there is no problem with any miracles or anything like that. And if he didn't, the gospel is nothing. And Paul made that clear. He said, if Christ is not raised from the dead, we are of men most miserable. Let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. A British barrister knew that. And he said, uh, I'm going to finish this one off once for all. He was an unbeliever and he said, I'm going to write a book that exposes the resurrection of Christ from the dead as a myth and as a fairy tale. 
and he gave himself to the task. Now a lawyer is very well equipped to examine eyewitnesses' stories and some of the things that might bother us when we read the gospel accounts, lawyers recognize the validity of. Well, Frank Morrison was his name, and he gave himself to the task, and he wrote the book. And the title of the book is Who Moved the Stone? You can buy it in a pocketbook today. And Frank Morrison wrote that book as a believer in Jesus Christ because he brought all of the evidence into the courtroom of his mind, and as he stood there as judge over the evidence, he found to his own satisfaction that Jesus was alive from the dead. He who was crucified on the cross, dead and buried, came out of that tomb alive. And he recognized it by committing his life to follow the one whom he had discovered. Our certainty is that Jesus is alive. The book is closed and we talk of this experience of death. But Jesus is alive and he said, because I live, you shall live also. And we believe fully that mom is in the presence of the Lord. And that's why we sing. That's why we sing tonight. One more fact. Our future. God's word has some beautiful things to say to us. I like to retreat into a fantasy life every once in a while, don't we all? God's word says, but when the time had fully come, this is in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has also made you an heir. That's what I like to fantasize about. I've said to the Lord, well, Lord, when you come back, maybe you could make me, I'm not thinking of galaxies or anything, but I wouldn't mind being mayor of Princeton, New Jersey. That seems like a nice town. Do you think about those things? But that's what the word of God assures you of. That's our future. Someone gave me this, and I don't know the person who wrote it, but on it, there's some writing, and it says, died at age 43 of brain cancer. And that the person, Shirley Mandoni, wrote this three weeks before she died. And as I read it, I thought of Mom. Listen to it. Along the golden streets a stranger walks tonight, with wonder in her heart faith blossomed into sight. She walks and stoops and stares and walks and stares again, vistas of loveliness beyond the dreams of men. She who was feeble, weak, and shackled to a bed now climbs eternal hills with light and easy tread. She has escaped at last the cruel clutch of pain her Lips shall never taste her bitter cup again. Oh, never call her dead, this buoyant one and free, whose daily portion is delight and ecstasy. She bows in speechless joy before the feet of him, whom seeing not she loved, while yet her sight was dim. Along the golden streets no stranger walks today, but one who, long homesick, is home at last to say, stay. I thought of mom with her art and her love for beauty and her love for perfection and her believing in the Lord Jesus. I thought of how delightful that new land will be to her. How delightful. How she must revel in it. Sometimes we wonder if those who have left us see what's happening. 
I don't know, sometimes we're so self-centered we think of things like that. I think they're away enjoying the great and glorious vistas of a new and perfect land. I think it would be very painful for them to come and it would be, oh, I won't even say it. It's not worth saying. But mom walks the golden streets tonight. I believe that we're all here for a purpose and that God brought you here. And I thank him for bringing you here. But God gives us different experiences to turn our thoughts to him. And he's done it again. You know, there are not many options that we have when it comes to Jesus Christ. They say that there are four. They all begin with L. You can say that the record of his life is a legend. Is a legend. And that it really is not a true history. It's a legend. But you know, if you really use your mind, you wouldn't be able to say that. You know, one of the great men in literature, C.S. Lewis, said that it couldn't be that. Because if it's not a true history, the Gospels are a form of literature called the historical narrative that never appeared in the history of man until the 18th century. It's 18 centuries too early to be a legend. It couldn't be. Well, you could say that he didn't, didn't tell the truth, and then you're faced with calling him a liar. He said that he was God in the flesh, come to be the savior of mankind. And he came to be your savior. And you could say he's a liar. But then how could we say that he's a liar when the one life that has brought more good and more understanding between men, more peace. Could you call him a liar? I don't think that you really have an option there either. Then you could say, and it's an option that I remember I called to the attention of an editorial writer in the newspaper when he said Jesus was a good man. I said, you don't have that option to say that he was a good man. Because either he's a liar for calling himself God or he's a lunatic because people who call themselves God in our world are put in mental hospitals. And so as we think of those three, we don't really have the option to call him any one of those things because we know he wasn't crazy. He was the most sane person that ever walked. And so we're left with one other one and that is to call him Lord. And I'd like to call you to him tonight. I'd like to call you to put your trust in him. I'd like to invite you to say yes to the Lord Jesus in the secret recesses of your heart. I'd like you to see that on the cross he died for your sins personally and if going through this experience with us has brought you to understand that, we'd think it something most precious. But you could say, Lord, Lord Jesus, thank you. You could say, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I don't know what it means altogether, but I'm going to trust you to answer my prayer and show me. There's a case on the law books. And it goes like this. A man was in prison. And the governor had pardoned him. And the warden came to his cell and said, you've been pardoned, here's the papers, collect your things, you're being released. And the man said, no, I'm not. 
The warden couldn't understand. He says, don't you understand what I said? You're at the governor's signed department. Here's the papers. Collect your things. You're being released. He said, oh, I understand, all right, but I'm staying here. The warden said, no, you can't stay here. You have to go. The man said, I don't have to go. I'm staying here. I don't understand the reasoning of the man. We would think that he was not quite right for saying something like that. Who would choose a cell in prison over against freedom and life? But he did. Well, the courts had to decide the issue. The man insisted on staying. The warden said he had to leave. He went to the courts. The court found for the prisoner and said that the pardon is not in effect until the prisoner receives it. And since he did not receive it, he is still under sentence and a prisoner. And so he stayed in jail. And I think you can see the similarity of why I told you that story. It's a true story. Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross, made it possible for you to be pardoned from everything that you did contrary to the law of a holy God. And he pardoned you with his blood. Now the choice is yours. Do you say, thank you, Lord? Or do you say, I want to stay in my cell. I want my own life. I'll not take your mercy and your love. Well, I'm here today, and I know my whole family stands behind me and says, come to Jesus. There's nothing like it. He gave us a beautiful mother. We saw him in her life, and it continues on. Won't you come too? Let's pray. It's important that you pray to God in the depths of your heart. Maybe you've been far away from the Lord. And you've taken your life into your own hands and you've tried to manage it yourself. And you want to draw near. You can tell him that tonight. Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I'm surrendering my life to you today. I'd rather be your servant than to be free any day. I'm yours, Lord. You could tell him that tonight. Right in the depths of your heart. If you've never heard this story, if you've never realized that you have to take Jesus personally as your own Lord and Savior, you can do that. You can tell him. You see, it's a relationship, and we establish a relationship by speaking to another person. And Jesus is a person, and he can hear you just as he heard Mom on so many occasions. And he'll respond to that. And you could say, Lord, thank you for dying for me. I want you to be my Lord. You know, I take it a great privilege of you sharing that fact, if you've prayed either one of those prayers tonight with me. I'd like to pray for you in the closing prayer tonight. And if you've prayed either one of those prayers, if you've just longed for the Lord to come and be your Lord and, and re-consecrate yourself to Him, or if you've come and you've said, I never knew that and I want to do it tonight, would you just slip up your hand so I could see it just for a moment? Thank you. Anyone else? Is there anyone else that would slip up their hand and say, I want Jesus to be my Lord? Lord, Thank you for the privilege of knowing you. Thank you for knowing that you loved us and died for us and that we can hope in your love and mercy. Thank you, Lord, 
for the privilege of knowing your comfort and your grace in time of sorrow. And thank you, Lord, that while the book of a life is closed here, it has been reissued in heaven in a grander and glorious, more glorious fashion. And we look forward to the day when we shall fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen.